The world is a large and complicated place, and it is remarkable how many strange little realms are hidden away in various places. Something as simple as a decaying stump in a forest might be an entire world unto itself, at least to the little creatures that inhabit it. Microhabitats offer a seemingly endless variety of alien realms, largely imperceptible to us because of their diminutive scale. A closer look reveals places governed by unusual physics and populated with bizarre forms of life. Yet, despite their oddity, some of these miniature habitats may bear at least a passing resemblance to something more familiar. For example, there are quite a few places that resemble forests after a fashion. In these microscopic forests, the trees are quite unlike the more familiar plants encountered at our scale. That is only the beginning of the oddity, however. In such a place, one might encounter forms of life that would rival the most eldritch of alien monstrosities encountered in various works of fiction. Yet these creatures are quite real, even if they are typically too small for us to even be aware of. So let us take a few minutes to consider just one such habitat in the form of a hypothetical sort of voyage. Imagine, if you will, that you are walking through a forest, or something that seems very much like a forest at least. The trees, if you could call them such, have oddly patterned trunks, looking almost as if they have been covered in interlocking plates of armor, or perhaps vaguely rectangular tiles. Above, the branches bear unusually large leaves with serrated edges, and these are quite unlike any leaves you have seen before. Each is more like a stained glass window than a leaf, bearing a pattern of vitreous green shapes suspended in an oddly crinkled translucent sheet with a consistency akin to that of a heavy sort of plastic. The sparse gaps in this unusual canopy reveal a clouded sky several shades darker than perhaps it should be. There is the suggestion of titanic shapes in the distance, obscured by a shadowy haze. The feeble sunlight that reaches this place is tainted with a deep emerald hue, giving the space beneath the forest canopy an unearthly air of perpetual twilight. There is no wind to speak of, and the place is eerily quiet. Below, the ground seems to be largely made up of a chaotic tangle of decaying matter. Some fragments are recognizable as the yellowed remnants of branches and leaves, as though the current forest had grown above the grave of its predecessor. Within this decaying morass, there are a few large, somewhat angular boulders that look vaguely crystalline. There are also a number of gaps in this uneven ground, and worrisome hints of movement catch your eye every now and then in the shadowed depths. A faint noise catches your attention, drawing your gaze towards a bizarre creature lumbering slowly into view between the strange, scaly trunks. Its body is rounded, and it seems almost reminiscent of a tortoise at first. However, it soon becomes quite apparent that this is something else entirely. Tortoises do not have quite that many legs for a start, and the legs of a tortoise aren't bunched up towards the front of the body as they are in this animal. Above this cluster of bristled pointed legs is what appears to be a heavily armored head. The shells on the creature's head and back are both smooth and almost glossy, while the legs bear conspicuous joints. As for the face, it is little more than a cluster of various jointed appendages twitching eagerly in search of a suitable meal. Fortunately, the thing seems docile enough as it ambles slowly past. A sudden vibration makes the forest about you tremble, and you watch as the creature tucks its legs up beneath its head and then lowers the armor plate like the lid on a box. For a few moments, all that is visible is a smooth, armored spheroid, scarcely recognizable as an animal. Slowly, the creature raises its head once more and the legs extend outward. It resumes its slow, steady gait as it shuffles between the trees and is eventually lost from sight. After traveling a little ways through this realm, another creature catches your eye. This one has a vaguely similar, almost globular outline, but otherwise it looks quite different to the first creature. 
To begin with, it is relatively lacking in armor. Its body seems almost puffy, lending it a curious air of obesity. A pair of prominent dark eyes surmounts a rounded head. Six slender legs carry it along at a steady, trundling sort of pace, as a pair of long antennae waver inquisitively this way and that. Fine bristles coat the legs and antennae, and a fair portion of the head and body as well. The curious animal pauses as something seems to draw its attention. There is a sudden blur of motion as the creature is abruptly sent hurtling skyward at a terrifying pace, and it is immediately lost from view. All that remains is the faint mark of something like a forked tail in the matted, fibrous earth. Time passes, and the forest grows subtly darker. The scent of rain becomes discernible as the air grows heavy and humid. Then, with an unsettling abruptness, the forest is flooded. Water replaces air in mere moments, filling the spaces beneath the canopy. You watch as the trees about you subtly expand, almost like sponges, their branches straightening as their leaves flatten and extend outward to all sides. It feels almost as if they have taken on a new life, or perhaps awakened from some sort of slumber. All around you, other things are also beginning to awaken. Bizarre, translucent forms seem to unfurl, stretching into creatures even stranger than those previously encountered. A lumpish, eight-legged thing slowly ambles past, half swimming and half walking as its stumpy legs brush against the surrounding branches and leaves. The legs seem almost shapeless, but for the array of long, sharp claws at their ends. The head is similarly lacking in features, for the most part. There is something like a mouth at the front, though it appears to be little more than a simple round opening. The creature pauses for a moment at one of the leaves. It presses this mouth to the vitreous surface, and a series of needles extend into one of the angular green patches. The greenery is siphoned up, leaving an empty yellowish patch in the leaf. You watch the meal find its way down the translucent creature's gullet and into its stomach as it ambles onward out of sight. Another oddity catches your eye as a somewhat flattened, gelatinous sort of shape slithers into view. It seems almost like a thickened sort of animated carpet, albeit a rather badly unkempt one, covered with coarse hairs and bristles. You notice that the hairs on its underside are moving, and it soon becomes apparent that the creature is using them to creep along the various surfaces about you. At the front, a mouth surrounded by bristles sweeps in whatever particles of food come into reach. At the back, a pair of short spines trail behind the creature, though these appear to be relatively harmless. By this time, a number of fairly smooth, glassy worms are rising up out of the depths and swimming through the flooded forest with odd thrashing motions. Like the flattened creature, they seem harmless enough, living as scavengers, perhaps. One more creature comes into view. At first, it seems almost like a worm, though it is a rather misshapen one compared to the sleek, smooth creatures previously spotted. The front half of its body is somewhat expanded and quite irregular. There is something like a gizzard visible within this part of the body, and you can see translucent teeth flexing in a manner that might suggest hunger. The back of the body tapers off to a sort of tail, ending in a pair of small pointed appendages. You watch as the creature squelches its way along, before pushing its tail towards one of the nearby tree branches. It seems to anchor itself somehow, before doing something quite unexpected. At the front of the creature, the formless head opens, almost blossoming like some sort of profane flower. Two great lobes unfurl, ringed with oddly iridescent hairs at their edges. The hairs are moving in a surprisingly ordered sort of pattern, and there is suddenly a significant current in the surrounding water. You watch as any small object within reach is swept towards these lobes, to vanish down the open gullet between them. Once down the creature's throat, the gizzard makes short work of the captured meals. After a time, the monstrous thing lets go of the branch, and glides through the water with surprising grace, carried along by the lobes and their iridescent fringes of swimming hairs. This bizarre, flooded forest, and the alien denizens, are actually remarkably common on Earth. 
They are generally too small for us to notice, of course. The most we might be aware of is a bit of greenish fuzz adorning a rock or carpeting the forest floor. For this strange realm is, in fact, merely a clump of moss seen from inside on a rainy afternoon. So now, it is time to explain some of the eldritch oddities encountered in this little thought experiment. To begin with, let us consider the moss, as it is as much the basis of this environment as trees are the basis of a more conventional forest. Mosses are a fairly primitive variety of plant within the taxonomic division Bryophyta. While some consider mosses to be the only proper bryophytes, others include the hornworts and liverworts in this group. Incidentally, the term bryophyte literally translates into moss plant. Sometimes, bryophytes are referred to as non-vascular plants, in contrast with the more advanced vascular plant groups. However, such a designation is somewhat misleading, as mosses often have reasonably sophisticated vascular systems. They do lack one vital component found in more advanced plants, though. Their cell walls are lacking a key substance. Lignin is a complicated, non-repeating polymer that is notoriously resilient and difficult to break down. When combined with cellulose fibers and various hemicelluloses, the resulting material is remarkably tough. This blend is the foundation of most plant cell walls, and by extension, forms the structural basis of wood. It allows some plant species to grow to titanic sizes. Without lignin, the mosses are functionally limited to maybe a few inches in height. Their leaves are simple structures, usually with one single central vein, though a few species might have two or three, while others have no veins at all. In the vast majority of moss species, each leaf consists of only a single layer of cells. Under the microscope, these patterns of cells often have an appearance reminiscent of stained glass windows. Different moss species have different cell patterns, which can be used for identification. Instead of roots, mosses have structures known as rhizoids. Each rhizoid is little more than a chain of connected plant cells with an overall arrangement not unlike that of a fungal filament. While this structure is quite simple, it is sufficient for conducting water from the soil and holding the small plants in place. The moss structure is not its only peculiarity. To understand the next unique feature of these little plants, one must first understand the unusual reproductive cycle of plants in general. Plants have what is sometimes known as an alternation of generations. Put in its simplest terms, there is a haploid generation of gametophytes that produces gametes, and a diploid generation of sporophytes that produces spores. The spores grow into gametophytes, while the gametes combine to grow into sporophytes. In the vast majority of plants, including conifers and flowering plants, the plant that you see is the sporophyte, while the gametophytes are reduced to components of the cone or flower structure. To understand the degree of reduction, every pollen grain is in fact a highly modified version of a male gametophyte. In the bryophyte, lycophyte, and pterophyte groups, these two generations are separate. In the pterophytes, or ferns, and the lycophytes, or club mosses, the visible plant is, once again, the sporophyte. The gametophytes in these groups are tiny little plants that appear as little more than green spots on the soil. In contrast, the gametophyte generation is dominant in the bryophytes. That is, the visible moss is the gametophyte. Meanwhile, the sporophyte is little more than a small structure that arises from an otherwise bare stalk on the moss at certain times of the year. Last of all, the bryophytes exhibit a somewhat unusual survival strategy seen in a number of different groups. They are poikilohydric, meaning that they can survive regular periods of desiccation. While most plants have a waxy cuticle to prevent and restrict undue water loss, the mosses have no such protection. They simply allow themselves to dry out and enter a sort of suspended animation when they do so. The next rainfall wakes them up, and they resume the business of living while the water persists. 
The ability to effectively pause life functions in the absence of water is sometimes known as anhydrobiosis, which roughly translates to life without water. Accurate enough, as such terms go. Despite their ability to survive water loss that would be lethal to most organisms, it is better for the mosses if they can prolong the intermittent periods of hydration. At the very least, the extra time is useful for reproduction, as the male gametes produced by these plants move by swimming through water. Thus, mosses have a few adaptations to prolong their watery phases of life. Their tissues can absorb and hold water, while their overall structure tends to retain water in the spaces between stems and leaves. One of the reasons that most mosses appear a bit fuzzy is that this pattern produces a number of tiny spaces ideal for holding water. A person can easily see this water retention, as a moss mat in a shady spot will remain damp for quite some time after rain, while most of the nearby surfaces have dried off. In effect, this cycle of flooding and drying creates a quite unusual sort of environment inhabited by a number of odd little creatures. Beyond the ubiquitous bacteria and protozoa, there are a few significant groups of invertebrates. Some of these share the moss's ability to survive intermittent periods of drying out, making them especially well adapted to such an environment. Likely the most famous of these groups would be the tardigrades, also known as water bears or moss piglets. The name tardigrade roughly translates into slow walking, which is a reasonable description of the leisurely gait seen in this group. These pudgy little invertebrates have eight legs, each of which bears a series of claws. Many species feed by extending a series of stylets from their mouths, allowing them to suck the cytoplasm out of individual cells. Some are content to feed on algal cells and the like, while others are more carnivorous. Another group that is comparatively obscure, but no less common, would be the gastrotrix. The name of this group translates roughly into stomach hairs, or hairy stomachs. This is in reference to the ventral cilia these invertebrates use for swimming or creeping over surfaces. They are mostly known as inhabitants of freshwater environments, typically living at the bottom of lakes and ponds. There are also several species that are found in the ocean. However, there is an appreciable population of gastrotrix creeping through most mosses as well. The rotifers are a third group that includes species capable of anhydrobiosis. The bedelloid rotifers in particular are known for this ability. The term rotifer translates to wheel carrier or wheel bearer. Such a name may seem rather odd at first as these invertebrates do not have wheels. However, they do have a structure that appears rather wheel-like under the microscope. The corona consists of a pair of lobes on either side of the mouth. Each of these has a fringe of cilia that move to generate a water current, sweeping food particles into the mouth. The motion of these cilia can often create the illusion of rotation, giving the overall impression of a wheel. Within the body, one can often see a rounded structure known as the mastax. This is essentially a modified sort of pharynx or throat, with jaw-like structures incorporated into it. These jaws are the only hard component of a rotifer's body, and they make short work of whatever gets swept into the creature's gullet. The tail of the rotifer is often referred to as its foot. This foot may have up to four little appendages at its end, appropriately called toes. Two toes is perhaps the most common pattern overall. In actuality, the reality of the situation is a little more complicated, but this is sufficient. In many species, these toes can secrete an adhesive that allows a rotifer to temporarily anchor itself in place. This is important while it is feeding, as the currents it generates would be sufficient to carry it away otherwise. Indeed, many rotifers use their coronal cilia as a means of swimming when they are not anchored to something. Another common inhabitant of the miniature moss forest is the nematode. These little worms are in the phylum nematoda. The name literally translates into thread-like or resembling thread. An apt description, as these slender worms are often relatively lacking in external features. Like the other groups mentioned so far, nematodes are quite common in many microhabitats. They are especially abundant in the soil, 
and may readily burrow down to avoid desiccation as the moss mat slowly dries out. There are other creatures that are a bit more resistant to drying despite their small size. The Calembolans are close cousins to the insects, and they are common soil inhabitants. While there is a good deal of variety in the overall form, the general pattern is a somewhat soft body with six legs and a pair of antennae. There is another appendage found tucked away against the underside of most Calembolans known as a furcula. This furcula can be rapidly extended in response to perceived danger, effectively catapulting the Calembolan some distance away. This feature is the basis of the common name for these creatures, which are often known as springtails. Last of all, let us consider another remarkably common group of tiny arthropods. Rather than being related to insects, these creatures are cousins to spiders and scorpions. They are oribatid mites, sometimes also known as beetle mites or moss mites. While they are certainly common inhabitants of moss, they are found in a great many other microhabitats as well. The term oribatid is likely derived from Greek roots that roughly translate into mountain wanderer. Perhaps this might be a reference to just how far afield one may find these little creatures. A typical oribatid mite has a rounded body encased within an armored shell. It is not uncommon for the head to be similarly armored and articulated in such a way that it can be folded downward for defense. In some species, the legs can be effectively tucked away between the head and body in a behavior known as tychoidy. In effect, the mite closes itself up like an armored box. This is the basis for another common name for oribatids, the box mites. Before concluding, I should address at least one final point. It is easy to regard moss as simply moss, and let that be the end of the matter. However, there are a wide variety of different mosses which have distinct structural qualities and live in different habitats. Some species are adapted to grow over exposed rock. Such species often become nuisances as they insinuate themselves between the shingles on roofs. Other varieties prefer to grow on shady patches of soil, often in a forest understory. Still others grow attached to the trunks and branches of certain trees. One tree species in particular deserves at least a brief mention in this regard. Acer macrophyllum, commonly known as the big leaf maple, is a species found in the northwestern coastal forests on the North American continent. Amusingly enough, the scientific name literally translates into Big Leaf Maple, mirroring the common name. As both of these names suggest, this tree is a variety of maple, and its leaves are indeed quite large, sometimes growing to a foot across, the largest known leaves of any maple species. However, the trunks of these trees might be more interesting than their leaves, Perhaps more than any other tree in temperate forests at least, the big leaf maple cultivates extensive coverings of moss. In coastal rainforests, mature big leaf maples are completely enclosed in green fuzzy mantles consisting of multiple species of bryophyte. The growth and decay of these mosses slowly generates a thin layer of soil between the moss and the underlying tree. This soil often becomes thick enough to support the growth of somewhat larger plants. It is not uncommon to see ferns sprouting from the mossy trunks of big leaf maples in wetter environments. However, the ferns are not the only plants to benefit from this arboreal soil. The maple itself will often grow tiny roots on its trunk extending into this soil layer. Effectively, the host tree derives a nutritional benefit from its resident population of bryophytes. To complete the strange absurdity, let us consider just one particular species of moss, Clamassium dendroides. This species is commonly called tree moss, not because it grows on trees, but because each moss plant resembles a tiny tree. There is a single stem with a cluster of slender, fuzzy branches at its top. At a glance, a cluster of this particular moss species resembles a tiny forest of palm trees. At certain times of the year, a cup of larger scale-like leaves sits at the top of each of these little plants. 
This structure is effectively the cradle for the developing sporophyte. While tree moss most often grows on the forest floor, it can also be found growing on the trunks of big leaf maples. So a single giant tree may become the home for a miniature forest growing out from what amounts to a vertical cliff face. There are thousands of other moss species, each with their own little peculiarities and habitat preferences, each with their own subtly different communities of tiny inhabitants. Even this appreciable variety is only a fraction of the myriad miniature environments that surround us. A million little alien realms, largely overlooked by our human senses. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have enjoyed today's little foray into the unknown. If you are still curious and wish to venture a little further, here are a few things you might consider looking into. If you found this video enjoyable, do feel free to leave a like. If you believe others might enjoy it, by all means, share. If you wish to see more of this channel, a subscription should prove quite helpful. Until next time.